Thank you for tuning in to the K-Onda Show with your host, Dee Dee Blaze, here on this great radio station. The K-Onda Show is a variety show specializing in the entertainment world in music, movies, television, sports, and other specialties. For the next hour, Dee Dee will bring you some interesting interviews to entertain and educate. So, if you're listening to this program at home or at the office, your smartphone, or your car, let's begin with Dee Dee Blaze on the K-Onda Show. This is Didi Garcia Blaze with the new Gonda Show, a radio show program that shines the spotlight on Chicanos and Latinos and those who like to work with us in the arts. And with me today is a special guest, Fernando Rodriguez. And Fernando Rodriguez was born in El Salto, Michoacán, Morelia, Mexico, but he was raised his entire life in San Jose, California. He started reading comic books in the first grade when he discovered a local paper recycling warehouse where he found dozens of heroes resplendent with intergalactic fantasy and lore. Several of these comics, Avengers, Iron Man, Submariner, Spider-Man, The Silver Surfer, Hulk, and X-Man, would become the foundation of his literary and art appreciation as well as a springboard for learning and sharpening his own comic book storytelling craft. He realized his goal of creating a Chicano slash Latino superhero in 1993 with his series, Aztec of the City. Welcome to the show, Fernando. Hi, Didi. Thank you for having me. You really grabbed my attention in knowing that you created the very first Aztec superhero in the comic book industry that was published. Yeah, yeah, yes it is. Uh, when, when I first did Aztec of the City uh, and we had our book signing at the Fairmont Hotel Lobby in San Jose, California on, uh, you know, I chose Cinco de Mayo to be the, the premiere day. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, I did research uh, as I was drawing it and writing it. And, um, uh, you know, to my knowledge at the time, there was no other uh, Mexican-American comic book superhero written by a Mexican-American Latino Chicano. Um, and it wasn't until later uh, in 1994 when I was at the San Diego Comic-Con uh, and I met all the other uh limited writers that had uh, entered the, the Latino comic book publishing uh, uh, landscape, and that was Rafa Navarro uh, in Los Angeles, uh, Richard Dominguez in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. And it was Richard Dominguez who told us about Judge Margarito Garza out of Dallas that in 1972 published a comic book that went three or two issues and that one was called Relampago, uh, which was about a, you know, a regular hero that some connection with lightning. Um, but the judge passed away. He was a, a, a criminal court judge, and they were trying to steer uh, Chicanos and, uh, and Latinos and Mexicans in the greater Texas area uh, into reading and away from getting in trouble. But the, the judge passed away, and his family, unfortunately, you know, uh, threw away or burned uh, a lot of his comic books, and so very few of those remain. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, uh, you know, a modern day, uh, I was the first one out the gate in 1993. Uh, Rafael Navarro and Richard Dominguez followed with Sunambulo uh, and uh, El Gato Negro, and Carlos Saldana had a comic book called Burrito, uh, The Jack of All Trades, and uh, we were pretty much the, the pioneers uh, in, in the mid-'90s. DC Comics uh, came out with an Aztec fictional character as well, but it was after you came out with yours. And that's when you were approached back in 1994, correct? When they approached you and yeah, you know, uh, whenever uh, the three years that we were at Comic Con and and the Wonder Con in Oakland and uh, the Ape Con, the Alternative Press Expo uh, in San Jose. Uh, Anytime that you're at a con, you know, you're always looking for, uh, hoping that uh, Universal or Columbia or one of the big studios, uh, you know, wants to do uh, some type of film reanimation with uh, with your property. Mm -hmm. uh, but the only ones that approached my table back then was DC Comics, and their two representatives were telling me about they were, you know, in the process of, of doing an Aztec book, but they made it very clear that it would be totally unrelated to mine that it was set in some distant future like star trek and uh you know i saw the 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 concept sketches of the hero and it was totally totally something different something that was not written by latinos and i believe aztec uh 
I think it survived like maybe six or seven issues before it was finally canceled. So, but back to your comic book series, yours, I've read some of your comic books, and it seems legitimate in parallel with the history that I know of with regard to the Aztec Empire, and you made a superhero from the strength of the Azteca Empire. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, it's definitely very fair to say. Um, you know, when I created, I was trying to think of a hero to create, at that time, uh, and a lot of the comic book guys are, are my, my, my friends, uh, like the ones I mentioned, Rafa and Richard, they had told me, you know, early on that, hey, man, you know, you really, you really hit on something when you, uh, when you picked an Aztec hero to, to feature, to, to write about, to, uh, to put together, and, um, you know, uh, I had read, uh, The Conquest of, of, of Mexico, The Conquest of New Spain by Bernard Diaz del Castillo, uh, and I did a lot of research about Cuauhtémoc, uh, about Tenochtitlan, about the conquest, about La Malinche, Malinchín. So, um, and I wanted to tie my hero in much the same way that uh, that Marvel Comics, uh, you know, has tied, like, say, Thor to to, uh, to, to that, you know, uh, type of history and lore. Um, so... Uh, I really wanted to make, uh, and you know, my hero, uh, Tony Avalos, uh, in, in the first series, which was volume one, he's a construction worker and, uh, an airplane, um, you know, this is 93, so it's many years before 9-11, uh, crashes into his building and he lapses into a coma, which is one of the greatest unexplained sciences or, 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 uh, you know, factors in, in the world is that the, Comas are very hard to explain. Some people come out of them like nothing happened, and others come out of it really childlike, and others are, are like in a vegetable state. Uh, but in, in the story, uh, the grandfather, he comes from Mexico City, from the land of Tenochtitlan, and he brings with him the blood in a vial, a jade vial of, uh, of, of the last king and prince of Mexico City, of La Mexica, of Los Aztecas, of Cuauhtémoc. And, and in that way, he becomes, by having the blood, uh, in his body, uh, the comatose Tony Avalos awakens as uh, the newborn Aztec of the city, uh, Aztec warrior. Mm -hmm. And and I've always tried to you know keep um, uh, like you know uh, references to tortillas de harina, caldos, and in the Mexican culture <laughs> uh, through the throughout the stories. I and, see and, the Spanglish references as well, you know, which I like as a Chicana. You incorporate Spanish with the English messaging within your comic book, and it has a, it feels familiar to me, and it feels like home to me, which is why I appreciated reading your comic books. Yeah, you know, uh, the reason that I changed it from uh, Volume 1 to Volume 2, uh, the Volume 1 version, uh, my brother and I kind of put together as artists, and the national distributor, uh, Diamond Comic Books, uh, out of Timonian, Maryland, they sent us a rejection letter, uh, stating that, you know, get back to us when the artwork improves. Who sent you the rejection letter? The national distributor that can put it nationwide. Uh -huh. You know, uh, after number two, um, I gave up and I, uh, a kid came to my, my, uh, a young man came to uh, my door. Uh, and he had gone to the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon Art and Animation. Uh, his name is Casey Quevedo. Uh, and so Casey and I said, hey, let's redo the book with your artwork. Um, and then that was volume two with uh, Casey's artwork. Uh, the book went nationwide, and I sold out the 5,000 copies of uh, number one and number two. Uh, working with Casey led to uh, Lowrider Magazine flying me down to Ontario where we did a uh, – a comic book strip in the back of Lowrider Bicycle Magazine called The Street Cruisers about these little Lowrider bike kids that, uh, you know, keep their neighborhood safe. Casey Quevedo, is is that the uh, Casey that you're talking about? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I, uh, I hired Casey back to help us with uh, issue number three where he did the, uh, the six-page mini-story of Cruz, the Christian warrior, which is... Uh, a story about a 12-year-old boy who's got long hair that gives him the strength of Samson, and he's got a staff that he controls the weather with. Uh, everything he that, that, that spews from his mouth is is, is from you know from mm -hmm. biblical text. I'm not interpreting anything from the Bible; it's just direct. But uh, you know there yeah. was a lot that they were calling and complained uh, in the first in volume two and one 
uh, telling me why why is the hero a construction worker? Why why can't your hero be why can't a Mexican be an astronaut, a scientist, a lawyer, an attorney? You know, so uh, that coupled with the other complaint from my college professor that that the early Aztec was speaking English and he was flying through the air like Superman, uh, that that prompted me to make volume three where the, the, the reading level is at a college level reading uh, a reading level and also you know, adapted the changes to the to the character where he's no longer a construction worker but he's a college student where by going to college and being a student, uh, Latinos can be anything they want to be. You know, I just really believe that an artist is inspired to write or create a character that comes out of his heart and soul. And um, and uh, I'm glad to hear that, you know, when you were giving up that Casey came into the fold. What are the other main artists of the uh, – who do you want to give a shout-out to with regard to the people that are doing the cartoon work? Uh, yeah, the current artists that we've had that have done the, the Volume 3 series, which is by far – the best comic books I've ever put together is, uh, you know, Jaime Nava Pastrana. Uh, he lives in Cabo San Lucas. We live right next door to each other. Mm -hmm. So we could have a Jack Kirby, Stan Lee type of uh, business relationship where we can go next door to each other and say, hey, what do you think of this and how does this look, et cetera. Uh, but, with, but with the advent of technology, I was able to hire Carlos Caballero, who lives in Orlando, Florida, and he did the artwork for uh, a mini story that is in the back of issue number three, which is the only comic book I've ever printed in color, full color. Um, he did the comic book, the short story called Mestizo, uh, the first Mexican who uh, is born of an Aztec mother and a Spaniard father. And he has blue eyes with his dark skin, so he's you know prone to uh, being a victim of bullying and, and, and being a... Uh, you know, a misfit uh, 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 because of because he's a, a mestizo because he's he's mixed mm -hmm. uh, like many of us are uh, in Mexico. Um, and uh, and and Casey, you know, Cavero, he helped with uh, number three. Uh, and I hired recently a uh, a guy in Colombia who is really really good. His style is reminiscent of a realism uh, uh, genre where it really looks cool and. Uh, uh, him and Kate, him and Jaime are working on issue number four, which is uh, to live and cry in L.A., where we feature La Llorona in Los Angeles, as well as a carjacking. And uh, I introduce the Brown Berets, and I also touch on the 1973 Chicano moratorium that uh, led to the uh, the death of L.A. Times reporter uh, Ruben, Richard Salazar. I believe that at some point you will be approached by a Universal Studios type with regard to your series Azteca or Aztec of the City. Um, I'm seeing here on your comic books that people can reach you through AztecofTheCity.com. How else can they reach you, Fernando? Uh, you have a Facebook page, Aztec of the City, um, comic books on Facebook. And uh, that, that's pretty much it. Those are the two, you know, social media and, 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 the, and the website are about the only ways. And, um, you know, I've met like Isai Morales and Jacob Vargas and Diana Ortelli, people in the Hollywood industry that, uh, mm -hmm. that feel the same way. Uh, that, you know, the, all the superhero films are, are obviously doing really, really well. And, and I believe uh, based on, you know, the, the popularity of... Uh, our own heroes that we've had, like 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 Richie Valens and uh, Selena, that uh, a, an action comic book hero would be something good for uh, the Latino community to see on on television or or on a big screen. And not just Latinos and Chicanos, but for the Anglo's to see our beautiful culture. And you know, and I wish you the best of luck. And how much are your comic books, and where can people? email to pay for and and buy these from you currently they can go to amazon.com and and find uh the comic books there and order them through them you got it then thank you so much for appearing on the Kilinda show and i'm completely stoked to have talked to a uh, chicano artist like yourself that uh, came up with the very first comic book superhero Azteca of the City, Aztec of the City. Oh, and thank you very much, Didi. Uh, it's like on uh, the, the film La Bamba where uh, Richie's mom tells him, you know, what you need is exposure. 
and uh, thank you for having us on and, uh, and giving us some of that exposure. Promoting cultural awareness, togetherness, and education through the arts. We're CRM. Hi, this is Didi Garcia Blaze with the new Gail and Beth Show, a radio show program that shines a spotlight and highlights Chicanos and Latinos in the arts. And with me today is Kenneth Castillo. Kenneth Castillo is a writer and a film director who began his writing directing career in 1996, producing theatrical productions at the Two Roads Theater in Studio City. After producing, writing, and directing several full and one-act plays, he turned his full attention to film. And in 2000, along with his producing partner and now wife, Carla, they formed a film production company called Valor Productions. Their first venture out was a series of short films entitled The Misadventures of Cholo Chaplin, a series of silent short films shot in the style of the serial shorts of the 20s and 30s and set in the world of the Day of the Dead. Several different episodes went on to screen at film festivals across the country, including HBO's New York International Latino and the Los Angeles International Short. In 2007, Episode 5, a Day at the Theater was accepted and screened at the prestigious Cannes Film Festival in France, and the following year won the Imagine Award for Best Theatrical Short Film. That same year, Kenneth was featured on American Latino TV as an up-and-coming Latino filmmaker and caught the attention of Plus Entertainment. Since July of 2008... Kenneth has written and directed seven feature films in the urban Latino genre under the title of the Drive-By Chronicles feature film series. Welcome to the show, Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really uh, appreciate you talking to me today. Yeah, you know, I just, uh, you know, over the past couple of days, I've been perusing your website, your real information, the YouTube information, and I'm one of those Robert Rodriguez fans, and and I got to tell you, you know, I was really wowed by your work. Um, the Thank you. camera, yeah, everything is so clear. Everything is just, it's, it's quality. It, your work is quality. And then, of course, I was additionally stoked when you featured Danny Trejo in The Counterpunch. Yes, and I appreciate you saying that um, because I don't have Robert Rodriguez's um, budgets, unfortunately, but um, I'm working my way up. And uh, with Danny, you know, for that particular project, Counterpunch, um, we were very lucky to get him. And also I was ex kind of excited to be casting him in a role where he wasn't playing a, a killer. He was actually playing, a, he plays a crisis counselor in, um, in that film where he's actually helping somebody. What was it like working with Danny? Um, he's great. I mean, he's exactly, you know, you know, the thing about Danny Trejo and a lot of these guys that kind of have lived a life and have, are, you know, taking their experiences and have become actors, they just have this incredible uh, humility about them and also this gratefulness that they're able to do what they're doing, considering they just, you know, have done a complete 180 in terms of changing their life around. And I knew Danny's history, um, you know, I've followed him my entire life because um, I've been a lifelong fan. And there was a great documentary I saw about him. So I got to learn a lot about him. So we molded the character to him, um, not knowing whether or not we could get him. So when we got him, it was pretty um, It was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I did see the softer side of Danny Trejo, and that's kind of what I see in your uh, trailers, in, your, in, the, in the teasers for the movies. Um, what I'm seeing in your movies is more of a – heartfelt uh, approach. Things are more personal. Uh, for instance, your the film that you're working on now with regard to the matador, where this little girl uh, is essentially playing a matador with a uh, schizophrenic neighbor. That trailer that I saw has a Robin Williams feeling to it. Is it I mean, I could easily see that schizophrenic uh, character be played by somebody like Robin Williams because that character that you created is making the little girl happy in, in a world where her mother is just working a job at night and going to school during the day. And is he going to Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, that's a testament to Ivan Basso, um, the actor that plays the character's name is El Toro. I've worked with Ivan on three other of my films. So to get him for this one, I was very fortunate, but he definitely brings the humanity 
he also brings, you know, a scariness to that character because he's very unpredictable. And a lot of the film, you know, talking about working with Danny Trejo, kind of connecting the two, you know, I, I improv, we improvised a lot of the scenes with Danny Trejo in um, Counterpunch. And it worked so well in terms of setting up and having clarity of the characters in the story and then just letting the actors go that I decided to apply that process to my entire film of Marigold and Matador. So there's, it's an unscripted film. I didn't, I didn't, I have one scene that's written throughout the entire film and it's an 85 minute feature. And so the actors were pretty much, you know, given a scenario and then we would shoot and I kind of had a story. I know where it was going to go. And um, so a lot of it was improvised. So when you see the video, you know, um, it's me basically creating a, a very free environment for the actors to work and still trying to keep us keep a through line um, with, a, with a story. I, I noticed uh, in looking at your website also that you have a lot of uh, Day of the Dead uh, a vibe. And mm -hmm. um, who, who did your – do you have one person who does the painting – Consistently? Um, I have two. I have two makeup artists. Um, in the well, it's interesting. In the Cholo Chaplin series, I, my father-in-law did all the makeup. He's uh, he's uh, he's a very technical guy. He's an electrician, or he, he used to be an electrician for the city, and uh, but very artistic and always was doing certain things and airbrush. And so I asked him if he could airbrush a Day of the Dead skull face for my characters, and of mm -hmm. course he did. And um, as we as I've kind of moved on and, and get, got bigger budgets, I came across a, uh, a makeup artist named um, Susie, Susie Q. Susie Molina is her real name, but she goes by Susie Q. And um, I found her work and hired her to do some stuff for me also. And also Amber Orozco, who is an artist outside of Long Beach, um, she actually did some makeup for me in my last feature film, which is called La Guapa. And um, so I have two makeup artists, I would say, that I u utilize for all those kinds of Day of the Dead vignettes and flashbacks and character makeup that I use. Going back to the counterpunch, your film featuring Danny Trejo as the uh, the crisis counselor, in the cover of that film that you promote, it looks like Danny Trejo is blocking a punch by the person who's the boxer. Is yes. he also a trainer? trainer? Oh, actually in that scene, it's actually, he's, he, Danny, Danny plays the crisis counselor to the lead character. Alvaro Orlando plays um, Alvaro, he plays uh, Emilio Manrique in the film. It's actually Alvaro's true life story. Um, he's a, he was a Golden Gloves boxer for 15 years. He suffers from bipolar. Um, he became an actor. He's an actor that I've worked with on three projects and he asked me to help him write the script for Counterpunch, which was his, his story and basically a tribute to his grandmother. So um, he, he produced it and he also co-wrote the script with me. I directed and, um, but yeah, it's his story. It's his true mm -hmm. life story. And he plays himself in the movie. Where can we, where can a person like me living in Arizona watch that movie? Do I buy that? You can buy it on Amazon. They have it uh, DVD on Amazon. Um, I know that. Uh, that movie came out in 2013, so it's not hard to find, um, but you could also rent it on Amazon Prime if you have Amazon Prime. It was on Netflix for two years. They may bring it back with all these boxing films that are coming out. Mm -hmm. um, which is what I noticed they do. Um, we were on Netflix for two years also. But, yeah, you could buy the DVD um, on Amazon, and there's a lot of great extras, little documentary series on a, a, an orga a great organization called Peace for Pitbulls, um, and then the making of the film and working with Danny. And um, there's, a you know, a BTS uh, extras on there and uh, outtakes and stuff. So it's really a great uh, DVD. But, yeah, it is on Amazon right now. I know that. All right, well, you've been listening to the Kewanda Show with our special guest and filmmaker, Kenneth Castillo. And uh, we are going to play a short clip of the Counterpunch film that he directed, and uh, we'll return after the break. All right, so you want to, all right, so how do we do it? Paper, rock, scissors? Okay, so you do it three? Okay. Paper, rock, scissor. Paper, rock, scissor. Damn. <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors. Oh, I got you. Hey, what's that? Bang! Oh, come oh, on, oh, man. You're a boxer. Oh, and you, oh. You're a boxer and you go for that? That's a cheap shot, man. My uncle was the same thing, man. <laughs> what up? You, you, you ever wondered about this? How does, how does paper beat rock? If you could just... Well, it covers it. Paper covers it. 
You know what I mean? It's kind of like boxing. It's like you, you, you swarm over somebody, you know, you clinch them up, they can't really hit you. So. You told me you used to box right now? Yeah, yeah, a long time, yeah. How was it? <sighs> yeah, it's tough. It's a tough way to make a living, you know what I mean? But, you know, sometimes that's all you got. You know, boxing is a lot like a chess game. You got to be two or three moves ahead, you know, because any time you throw a punch, boom, here comes a counter punch. Yeah. It's like when you throw a punch, you're already thinking on how you're going to counter the counter. You know, I'm going to throw this punch and I'm going to slide to the left to miss his right. Yeah, that's, 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 what, that's what all I do is counter punch. We'll return in a moment with the K Onda Show as we cover the entertainment world. Don't forget to pencil the Kaonda Show in your calendar. The program airs Thursday nights at 7 p.m. and then again on Sundays at 5 p.m. here on CRN Live. Now, let's continue with the Kaonda Show. Welcome back to the Kaonda Show, and with me is Kenneth Castillo, uh, who began his writing and directing career back in the 1990s. Thank you again for being on, on the Kaonda Show, Kenneth. Oh, absolutely. I'm honored to be here. I wanted to kind of go back into your seven films here. I mean, you, you've you got an incredible resume. Tell me about Hearts of Men because for some reason, you know, I'm looking at that and, and I see some some Cholo-like gangbangers. What's, what's, what's the meaning of that? Hearts of Men, I, it's, it just grabs me. What's behind that story? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. It's one of my probably more personal scripts. Um, it's about two twin brothers. One is a paramedic and another is a drug dealer. And um, I kind of want to do, it's more of a thriller actually, because the, the, um, the one twin who is a uh, drug dealer ends up getting murdered, but his crew doesn't know that. So this DA agent convinces the paramedic to kind of go undercover as his twin brother. But the interesting thing is the, the actor that I cast in that is Carlos Pratt. And if you're familiar with a film that came out um, earlier this year called McFarlane, he was in McFarlane. Oh, nice. Yeah, so he plays the lead character. So the reason I bring that up is because I've, I've read a lot of interviews that he's done, and they always seem to mention that McFarlane is his first lead work. And I'm like, no, he's done lead work before that. <laughs> oh, that's not cool. Yeah, but it's just it's just part of the it's just part of what you deal with because even if like if you look at Counterpunch, right, Yvonne's not in the uh, actually Yvonne is in the um, in the Counterpunch teaser. She's on uh, Jane the Virgin right now. She plays Abuelita on Jane the Virgin, and oh, I wow. cast her I cast her in Counterpunch three four years ago. So actually our first read through was like five years ago. So I've known of Yvonne and of Carlos you know long before anybody else. Uh, you know, it cast them in these bigger projects, which is great. It's, it's exciting for me to see them move on to bigger and better things. Absolutely. Um, but, it, but it also feels good that I, you know, I feel like I'm a decent casting director. <laughs> and also you want you want to set the, the record straight. And for the audience that is listening now, that that is pretty admirable. I, I have seen your your YouTubes and the reels and, and the teasers, the the work is quality. I don't know what cameras you are using, but they're very crisp and amazing. I mean, thanks. No, I've, it I've doesn't been blessed feel to work. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I say, I've been blessed mm -hmm. to work with some great DPs. I mean, in seven films, I've I've worked with one, two, three, four different DPs, and one of my DPs, director photography uh, photographers. Um, he had done three of my films. He did Ghost Town, Confession, and La Guapa. Um, and my director of photography now on Marigold is was actually my um, DP on the short film series, The Misadventures of Cholo Chaplin. So I, I work with guys that have taught me a lot. And um, I have a if I if I have any talent, it's putting the right people together um, for a project. Sometimes I've I've miscalculated with some people, but over the course of seven films, you know, you're going to have some bad apples, but I have to say that crew-wise, I've been very fortunate. You know, sometimes I'll navigate myself to an independent movie in Japan or China, and, and you know, I pay attention as just a regular fan, a movie fan. I. You think they look more mainstream? Yours look like what I would see in a theater. Fantastic. I'm so, um, that's a huge compliment because I, 
I know that getting a theatrical release for any of my projects is going to be a challenge. Um, so, but the, every single film I've ever shot, I've always shot for the big screen, you know, so I'm always looking at um, the bigger picture in terms of when I'm, when I'm shooting. So I really appreciate you saying that. Also, I wanted to thank you for the compliment you gave me earlier, just in the fact that, you know, uh, my there is a lot of heart in all my films. You know, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people peg my stuff as stereotypical because I'm in the urban genre, but, um, you know, they're, they're just commenting on a genre that they may not like. But, you know, I can tell you just in the writing process, I go above and beyond and out of my way to make sure those characters are living and breathing and um, like every like every character. So um, the fact that that gets noticed, I always, you know, that always makes me feel good because for the most part, um, people who don't like the genre are really quick to judge my work as stereotypical. Well, like you, um, I'm a big fan of Danny Trejo and that's why I wanted to explore that film and, and the teaser that is on your website. I And that's where I saw the quality of your work. Well, actually, it was the Matador film that I saw first. And, oh, great. Um, that's my oh, work. Yeah. Hopefully, it's my best. <laughs> right. I always and say, I always say hopefully my, my best is the one I'm working on right now. It feels mainstream to me. And I think so. I mean, I think it's a very simple idea, but it's significant. I just saw First Assembly this past Sunday with my editor, and she did, uh, you know, she put this, she put together a story where there is no script, and it made me feel really good with what she did, and it was easy to follow, and it was beautiful. And, and I just trying to put a face in a story behind people you may see on a daily basis. And that's all I did with this story, this single mom, this young, this young girl and this schizophrenic homeless man, you know, and I just, I hope I can finish it because that's what, that's partly why I'm, I'm on this kind of promotional uh, tour is because I'm trying to get people to look up the Seed and Spark campaign. We're raising some money just to finish it. It's already been shot. I just have to finish it in post. Um, and um, hopefully they'll visit the website or they'll visit, um, you know, maybe you can include a website uh, link, um, you know, when you promote the show. But, um, yeah, they, the people can actually help out directly with my with this film. Now, where can people contact you? KennethCastilleFilm.com, and where can they contact you through other social media outlets? Yeah, Facebook. I have a, the Facebook is a great place to contact me, um, Kenneth Castillo. If you just uh, type in Kenneth Castillo, you'll I'll pop up. I should be one of the first to pop up. Um, also on Twitter at Cholo Chaplin, um, and on Instagram at Cholo Chaplin. You know, moviegoers crave for something new and oh, fresh. definitely, definitely. Yeah, so that yeah I, really I like fresh. those movies too, and I definitely go to those movies, but like. I just saw this indie that I loved um, called Dope. I don't know if you saw it, but it went was at Sundance, and um, mm -hmm. it was it was so well done. And it's a tiny film, but it was really uh, really good. And you know, the thing is, sometimes people just don't know about about them because they don't. A lot of times, the studios won't put the marketing money behind the smaller films. So, you know, like I go out of my way to see any type of Latino film, but you take like two films that came out almost at the same time, McFarlane and Spare Parts. Both were really great Latino stories, but everyone knew about McFarlane because they spent the money to promote that film, where Spare Parts died in the first week of the theater because nobody knew about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's never, it's rarely about the quality of a film. It's always about, do people even know about it? Do people know it exists? And as an indie filmmaker, that's always your biggest challenge. It's like, okay, I made a movie. How do I get people to know about it? And then how do I get people to care about it? One of the ways is what you're doing right now is just talking to people like me who, you know, don't have big publicity and marketing budgets and, and, um, or connections or anything like that or just out there doing our thing. So I, I definitely appreciate you taking the time. I, I had no idea that you were uh, the film director for Counterpunch. And uh, I want to just be honest that I heard the buzz about Counterpunch, the movie, because of Danny Trejo through Belle Hernandez, who is behind Latin Heat Entertainment. So shout out oh, wow. to her. Yeah, she, she covered your film on her on her page, her Latin Heat page, and I was like, oh. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Danny Trejo's in another movie that I don't know about, and so here you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> and he plays a good guy. <laughs> I'm like, here you are. Hey, this is really cool. So, Kenneth, I want to thank you for appearing on the show that uh, shines a light on Chicanos and Latinos in the arts. And um, I, I'm i a big fan of yours now. And I, Thank I, you. Yeah, and I feel and I sense that um, you've got nowhere to go but up in, with regard to the quality and uh, the way that you personalize things in your film. Um, I'm proud of you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And you thank have, you for having me on the show. It's a, it's a great thing that you're doing, and I really appreciate you talking to me. Do you have anything that you want to tell the listeners? Um. Wow, I have so much. Yes, just go to Kenneth Castillo on my Facebook page, and you will find links to um, my campaign, and you can contribute directly. We're not trying to raise a lot of money. Um, I don't need that much to finish, um, but I do need your help. So if you can go to Kenneth Castillo or just Google Kenneth Castillo, you'll find me everywhere, and um, you can contribute. we got some great incentive, incentives that are directly linked to the film, and um and that's it. I hope, you know, I hope you guys check it out. Yeah. I, we keep talking about our, you know, we're misrepresented, we're underrepresented in Hollywood. I go, we got to stop looking at Hollywood. You know, the democratization of filmmaking, it, it's so cheap to make a movie. I go, if someone makes a movie out there for 50000 or even for a million dollars, and that movie is cast with a bunch of unknown Latinos, and that movie makes $100 million, that's what's going to open up doors. Nothing else. Not an organization, not a film festival. You know, not giving the same people a lifetime achievement award every year, that's not <laughs> going to do it. You know, what's going to do it is is someone being successful like a Tyler Perry and then hiring a bunch of Latinos and putting them in front of the camera. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do. I mean, that's great what Robert Rodriguez does, but we need to have a, there need to be 10 or 15 Robert Rodriguez's out there. You oh, know, I know. For us, to make, for us to make a dent in this business. But um, anyway, I have very strong opinions about it, so I don't really – I don't go to these things. I've just done the work. And people say, well, Ken, I never, I never see you at these networking things. I never see you at this thing. I go, well, how many You're movies have you You're too busy working. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, how many movies have you made? You, bet you go to every event. How many movies have you made? Oh, none, but I'm looking to raise money at these events. I'm like, these monies need your money to exist. I go, they're not going to help you raise money. Um, I go, go and make your movie. You have an iPhone. Go make a movie. So mm-hmm. I'm more about that. Well, Kenneth, thank you for appearing on the show, and um, oh, I hope no problem. I want to have you back for your future shows. Um, are you done with Matador? Is that one left? Um, no, no, not yet. Um, I'm hoping to have it finished by the end of September. Um, you know, I don't. Uh, I'm trying. I really want to. It's, I think it's a special film. I don't know how I'm going to get this out yet. I'm trying to find the best way I can get it out to the most people. So. You know, once it's finished, I'll let you know what our strategy is in releasing. You got it. Well, send me a press release. And uh, for those who are listening, uh, you can find out more about this up-and-coming film director, Kenneth Castillo. And uh, you can uh, reach him at KennethCastilloFilm.com. And um, thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to pencil the Kayonda Show in your calendar. The program airs Thursday nights at 7 p.m. And then again on Sundays at 5 p.m. here on CRN Live. Hi, this is Didi Garcia Blaze with the new Kayonda Show, a radio show program that shines the spotlight on Chicanos and Latinos in the arts. With me today is special guest Charlie Beetle Vasquez, who is a drummer and a vocalist with the band Brother Bones R&B Show. A um, little bit about Charlie is um, he has been a drummer for the likes of Big Joe Turner, Al Wilson, The Olympics, The Coasters, Jimmy Charles, Brenton Wood, Don Julian, Sly Slick and Wicked, Mary Wells, Joe Houston, Jimmy Charles, Jules Aikens, Eddie C. Campbell, Deacon Jones, and Bobby Lewis to name a few. Charlie's has also been a vocalist and a drummer for Rosie and the Originals. You remember her? She was uh, the creator of Angel Baby, the famous Chicano song uh, that everybody, every Chicano that I know loves. Um, Also working with uh, Charlie in the new band are artists 
such as Mario Gonzalez, who is the lead guitarist and background vocalist. He also plays the bass. And Phil Gaitan, keyboard player and background vocalist for Brother Bones R&B show. Welcome to the show, Charlie. Well, thank you very much. Glad you, to be here. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you for sharing your music with me. And it, you have a long resume of musical history and background. Tell me, what is your favorite moment, your favorite highlight in in music? For me personally, if, um, two, just two. Uh, one, okay. I got to see the Beatles live when the last time they were here in L.A., back uh-huh. in the 60s. That was a big deal, like, kind of like an, the inspiration for a lot of young guys that were up and coming in music back then. And um, I, I come from a, of a, a hard rock back in the 60s, early 70s, hard rock, rock and roll background. And when I got asked to take over this band called Odyssey, it was a, the band itself was nothing more than an oldie but goodie backup band. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got to meet a lot of these stars, these so-called uh, one-hit wonders. They were one-hit wonders nothing. They were the greatest. Brenton Wood, Big Joe Turner. Um, there's, a, there's just uh, Jewel Lake and, like, you, well, you read off the list. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was, uh, to me, that was the big deal. It, was, it like, opened my eyes uh, because all these people that were all of a sudden walking up on stage and we go right into their song. It was like memory lane, and that's mm-hmm. the one thing that I really enjoyed about these oldies was uh, constantly going down memory lane. But when we put together Brother Bones, I, I had a lot of um, to fall back on for ideas for writing lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, we we didn't want it to be the typical three chord progression that most blues, per se, bands do. Our stuff was a little bit more involved, and it's it's been a lot of fun. We get a good response whenever we play. But that was the eye opener getting hardcore into oldies. Now, Brother yeah. Bones R&B show is an original style blues and rock band yes. where you go mm-hmm. from traditional blues to rock, a Billy to a fusion rock blues jazz feel. Would that accurately describe your genre? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you hear, like, uh, the song, uh, Blue, So Blue, Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a we call it the hook it's like the ultimate hook if you listen to the very beginning of the song um i'm pretty sure as soon as you hear you hear that intro that the guitar does one one little riff you'll know what song uh, what inspired that little riff there. um mm-hmm. the other song that i sent you was um don't talk about me totally mm-hmm. different you know we've uh they've asked us hey, you know that isn't a blues song it is to us it's mm-hmm. a shuffle, like any other blues song is. It's a shuffle, except that somebody took the time to come up with some really nice chords, which is Phil Gaetano, a keyboard player, mm-hmm. and a guitar player. These guys really worked, they worked their fingers to the bone to put some of these melodies together. And then I just have to write some lyrics. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's about it. Like, what, yeah. it what inspires you? I mean, what, what kind of inspiration do you use to write your lyrics? Some of these you know, nothing nothing beats uh, uh, no love story. Uh, I like being comical at times, mm-hmm. you know, um, just off the wall. But the inspiration comes from just everyday life. I've been uh, for me, I've been I've been with my wife since we were fourteen years old. So mm-hmm. a lot of inspiration there. A lot of inspiration. So, what was your yeah. What was your last inspiration that you used in the last lyrical creation that you came up with? Can you get blue when we uh, when we did blue? Um, not all stories, and I'm sure you've heard them. Not all stories uh, written or all lyrics written are about the 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 the, the really nice the niceties of being in love. You know, some of them are. You know, there was a there's rough spots. Mm-hmm. And I think that was very inspirational for me to get those rough spots out and say, hey, you know what? We've got blemishes like anybody else, and you can make <laughs> it. You know. Let's go to uh, Behind Angel, Baby, Rosie and the Originals. I mean, that, that had to be one of your highlights, uh, working with the woman behind a well-known lowrider community, Chicano community song. It was an honor. 
it was always an honor. I'll, I'll share a real short, quick story. It never ceased to amaze me. Mm-hmm. When we'd be back, here we are now in our 50s, and we'd be playing, whether it was in Vegas or an oldie but show out this way or in Arizona, mm-hmm. we would, I would always, being the drummer, I tend to be scoping the people out, just looking back and forth with the people enjoying the show, and it never failed. There would always be a few couples way up against the stage looking up at Rosie as she's singing the song, and as soon as she'd get into her, ooh, I love you, you start crying, and that's, that that always got me. I'd always put a lump in my throat. I don't care how many times I saw it. It always, uh, you know, it never ceased to amaze me. How did I you even meet her? How did you guys meet? How did I, well, during, uh, back when I was playing with Odyssey, um, mm-hmm. like we were a hardcore oldie but goodie band, they yeah. asked us if we wanted to back up the, the yaks that were on the show. And, yeah. So we'd back up the coast of all those, just about all the people you named off. At one time or another, they were all on one of our shows. Junior and Odyssey was a was a hardcore oldie but goodie band, and we were working uh, for Rick Ward, this old DJ that took over Wolfman Jack's old radio station, XBRS, mm-hmm. and Eddie Torres, Eddie Torres being the manager of the Midnighters, the only manager they ever had. And we're talking to the original members, Lily G., uh, Romeo Prado, Larry Rendon, George Dominguez, George Salazar, Danny Lamont, Roy Marquez. These guys, not the, now there's everybody out there but the original members. These are the, these are the members. As a matter of fact, in Odyssey, George Dominguez, original guitar player on all the recordings of the Midnighters, he became my guitar player. So all those oh, years wow. that we were backing up all these acts, it was George Dominguez playing lead with us and touring with us. Nice. You've got a, yeah. an impressive musical background, long history of music behind your life. Um, how could my audience get a hold of you and purchase a CD uh, with regard to the band and Mario Gonzalez and Bill Gaixan, uh Brother Bones and R&B? How can my my listeners reach out to you? Well, um, the, as far as uh, you want to get a hold of a CD, have them go to Spotify. Mm-hmm. S P O T I F Y Spotify Records and go to uh, C D Baby and you can you can get C D through them. Right. If they need to contact us, well you've got my number there, just go ahead and post it. Just post okay. it on you know, on the site. To those who are listening and who would like to purchase a C D from uh Charlie Vasquez and the band, please contact him at Maya one three one six four four at Yahoo dot com or you can contact him directly at 760-861-9709. Thank you for listening. And thank you for coming to the show, Charlie. And thank you for the invite, Didi. And now we will play a tune from Charlie Vasquez and uh, with regard to his band, Brother Bones R&B Show. Said I'd hit the road. I'll no longer be your bad time at home. Leaving the lies, I'm out of here. I'm staying away, steering perfectly clear. Cause your kind of love and the kind that is wrong. It weakens the heart of one who was strong When you wake up tomorrow It's me you won't see You suffer no sorrow And I will be free Making a fool for all that is worth Making you worthless feel like this Cut your kind of love in the kind that is wrong You weaken the heart of one who was strong yeah. Understand how you could bring down a very proud man. I was so wrong to think you would change, but women like you are all 
who's the same When you're kind of loving The kind that is wrong It weakens the heart of one who is strong When you wake up tomorrow The thing you won't see There's something no sorrow And I will be free Take it up for all that he's worth Making me worthless Be the logic When you're kind of loving The kind that is wrong The weak in the heart of one who is strong yeah. This program is the property of Star Sound Music Group, Hollywood, California, and is available for syndication by emailing your request to affiliates at kondashow.com or call toll-free 213-283-STAR. Educational institutions, please call to see if your school qualifies for free licensing on your campus radio station. This program was produced by D.D. Garcia Blaze. Executive producer is Frank Miranda. Imaging by David Tyler. Thank you for listening to The K-Onda Show.